Hi, friends. Thank you for coming here. Uh, thanks for wanting to listen to us and learn about prevention of human trafficking in the U.S. and abroad. My name's Sandy Leger. I am the co-founder, president, and chairman of AbolishSlavery.org. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce Aaron Cohen here. He's our speaker, human rights activist. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about our organization and the movement to free slaves. Slavery has changed over the years. It certainly wasn't abolished 150 years ago with the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation with Abe Lincoln. As our president today says, human trafficking is modern day slavery. At Abolish Slavery, we work to prevent the spread of modern day slavery by helping establish and mentor human trafficking task forces domestically and internationally. That's a mouthful. <laughs> These task forces find and protect human trafficking victims and promote the infrastructure needed to rescue victims and assist them on the road to recovery. Today, more than ever, victims of human trafficking are being prostituted, enslaved, abused, tortured, and murdered by predators who exploit their vulnerabilities. But with your help and with the help of victim service providers, we can free the captives together. The human trafficking movement in the US is growing and with it, many organizations are training law enforcement to better understand the complex dynamics of domestic prostitution and sex trafficking. We recently completed a series of investigations and rescues in New York working with the NYPD. And Vice Detective Chris Bachman from the Metro Las Vegas Police Department and certified shelters. These partnerships were the glue that kept us together. Ooh. And it led to, to the rescue of several victims. One of these victims is a young lady named Christina. She's from New Hampshire. And I was there for all of this, as actually as were Melissa and Gracie, my daughter. She'd been trafficked all throughout New Hampshire, all the way down to New York. And we rescued her. It was abolished slavery with the NYPD help. Her emotional reunion with her mother was successful. And she's now seeing a counselor. She's applying to colleges. And she has a blog that you can visit at, where, what's the name of it? Coercion to Freedom dot WordPress dot com. Great. And her name's Christina. With us today, speaking of, is the, vit the victim advocate for abolished slavery, Melissa Grace Hoon. Could you stand up? <laughs> it's Melissa's responsibility to coordinate survivor transition and security, as she did with our survivor from New Hampshire so that post-rescue, our survivors receive the best care possible from the service providers and making sure that their unique situations are helped. As of late, we've been increasingly using technology in our investigations and finding sex trafficking victims online. We document them. And we're allowed now to see something, I think Erin's going to say later, something that was invisible that we don't normally know about to something that is visible. For the last two years, Abolish Slavery has trained law enforcement in human trafficking investigations in Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, Haiti, Mexico, 
Okay. Ooh. Wow. Okay. That's like being at a department store when you see yourself on the camera. Uh, where uh, and also in the U.S. with the FBI's help. We plan to begin our next round of investigations next month at, we don't know exactly where we're going to be um, because we've had to change plan. The victims um, actually moved from, they had, the traffickers moved them, so it's not going to be where we had intended in Texas. But we continue to work with law enforcement when we do the investigations and the rescues and transition the victims from a life of slavery to a life of freedom. We just take it so for granted. <laughs> We're also working on our next installment of books and television production. Uh, we're excited to develop some PSAs and other media to raise awareness and to raise crucial funds needed to continue the work of bringing freedom to those who are lost in modern slavery. It's my hope and all of our hope that this short film we're about to show you will help explain the painstaking work of rescuing victims who at this very moment are enslaved in the U.S. Human trafficking is the fastest growing illegal business. It's already passed arm sales and it's in position to pass drug sales. Ever since the internet boom, sex trafficking has been growing at an alarming rate. The massage parlors of Asia are teeming with young human trafficking victims. I met Na while working undercover in Cambodia. She told me she was 19, but I could see she was much younger. What? You're so shy. Right hand turn, we're moving into the hot zone right now. We're now literally three buildings away from the retrieval. I would rank Cambodia as one of the worst places for sex trafficking. So we're getting ready for the SWAT guys to come out of the station. Basic estimates suggest that there's up to 27 million slaves in the world today. Here in Haiti, there's an unprecedented 300,000 rest of it domestic slaves. I look and I see some of the children carrying things in the street. I can't help but feel as if we're looking at modern day slavery here in Haiti. The ancient land of Kush known today as Sudan, was connected to Egypt by the Nile River. Tradesmen and camel caravans waged bloody civil wars for the past centuries over the natural resources, leaving African tribal communities destitute. And that heartbroken parents were facing an agonizing choice when they discovered that their children had been taken to this little known place called Darfur. It was a long, difficult journey for the former slaves to walk home hundreds of miles across the front lines of a civil war. Silence. But I think they're starting to figure out what's happening. And so nobody should be afraid. It's going to be a good day. It's a happy day. And that very soon you'll all be able to go back to your, to your homes and to find your mothers and fathers and your husbands and other relatives and friends. And that's it. This is the children. They are running after to be reunited with their families. And they're very excited. They're very happy. The families are being reunited. This is the children that were just released. There's pandemonium breaking out as they hug each other that they're free. A lot of them have been abused and have suffered many terrible things. And they're very excited. You see joy breaking out everywhere. Today's your day, man. Right? Right.
Okay, buddy. We hold this step for you. When Arison's mother unwittingly turned him over to his aunt, he was brokered into domestic slavery, forced to work 14 hours a day, and beaten if he did not obey. He hadn't seen his mother in more than 10 years. So, at the age of 12, Arison returned home and was reunited with his mother. Serious business. It is very dangerous to do this work. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. It came back from the human trafficking division that she was a legal adult, that the documents were in order. The tape says it all. The, the, the truth is the truth. And no matter how hard you take the truth and try to make it something else, it's still the truth. They're not always happy endings. Right in there is our little. Uh, our little girl, right now the girls are probably still sleeping. You can help some people, but inevitably the one you leave, leave behind becomes so much more prominent in your mind than the ones that you can help. And that's something I always live with. I always live with the fact people say, well, how many children have you rescued or how many slaves have you freed? And the answer is, is how many have I left behind, really? And that haunts me. It stays with me. It never leaves. I've only watched that a few times, and um, the boy, he was two years old when they took him, and I have a two-year-old. I can't even, I mean, he can't even make real sentences yet. Can't even imagine. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Aaron Cohen. He's the mission director for Abolish Slavery. He's an award-winning, I'll give you all the goodies about him. He's an award-winning writer and human rights activist who draws his inspiration from the Jubilee, which is an ancient law of debt forgiveness and setting the slaves free. Media, including Fox, CNN, Larry King Live, MSNBC and NBC have lauded Aaron's work in finding and rescuing victims of human trafficking. He was awarded the U.S. Congressional Certificate of Merit, the Prize for Humanity, and the NBA, not NBA, the Major League Baseball's Greatest Save Trophy for his efforts combating slavery in the United States and in dozens of countries. Working the, with the Abolish Slavery team, Aaron trains counterhuman trafficking task forces and undercover police officers in the U.S. and other countries. His memoir, Slave Hunter, One Man's Global Quest to Free Victims of Human Trafficking, has been translated into many languages and will be available at the book table following our presentation. Melissa and I and Gracie, We'll also be at the table if any of you are interested in making a donation or asking us about uh, how you can be involved, how you can help, and uh, how you can be part of setting these slaves free. So without further to do, I give you Aaron Cohen. Thank you. How is everybody today? I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you about slavery. The original topic for the discussion uh, sort of germinated when my friend Michael P. Hale from Google and I were talking about the use of technology in saving lives. And so we, we together came up with this idea to sort of do a little study, a little bit of investigation 
about how the role of technology is changing both human trafficking tremendously, but also human existence. So if we're going to talk about the role of technology in saving lives, two things need to be defined first. First of all, we have to define technology. What is technology? Where does it begin? Well, who are the originators of technology? And secondly, we have, to do, we have to define life. How does life begin? What is life? So what was really interesting for me is, you know, I'm a human rights activist and I travel around the world working with vice detectives. We work in task forces trying to find victims of human trafficking and, and it can be pretty dry at times. It's your typical scene, drinking coffee and eating donuts and most of the time waiting around. So I got really excited when Michael talked to me about putting the speech together because I learned a lot of things studying about technology. Ultimately, we're trying, all of us in this room, to take our little, our life, and when I say little life, I'm referring to myself, and you know, look at me, I'm very oddly tall, right? Am I in the uh, Johnny Cash fan club? Maybe, you know. But uh, the thing is, is that we're trying to take our little life, which is a drop, in, a drop of a little stone in the water, and our little waves come out to our family and our friends and to our outer circles. Of how, do we, how do we move that from just a small impact to something big? And I, really, I realized that in looking at technology and in life in general, the answers are, are, are there. But what's so unique and so different about this topic is that the line between life and technology is becoming more and more blurred. So when we talk about the beginning of, or idea of a big, a big bang, I'm going to go through a little bit of a history of science with you. You know, we have these competing theories on quantum physics, the idea of string theory, where mathematically they put together a 10-dimensional reality. And then you have another group of physicists saying they, they, they support this idea called M-theory, which is really an 11-dimensionality that then collides with the 10th to create this big bang. And what happens in a Big Bang is that this explosion occurs, this massive explosion, and then like the little pebble in the water, these huge cords of universes and galaxies come out from that big explosion. And essentially the oldest writing we have in the world, the, when I went to try to find the origins of slavery, where slavery begins, the oldest writings in the world are talking about the cords of our galaxy, and that's the cuneiform tablets from ancient Samaria. They even name it. They, they would look to Orion's belt as sort of this grand central station that could take them through the Pleiades to the northern star where all the other stars rotated around the northern star. And there was this ancient belief that somehow the domain of the heavens was, or the throne of the creator, shall we say, was vested in this northern position. And so the cuneiform writings talk largely about this. They, they named the first chord from the, from the center, Norma. They named the second chord, Crux. The third was called Sagittarius. And the fourth was called Orion. And that's where we live. Our Milky Way galaxy is on the fourth chord from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And we're on planet Earth, the third planet from the sun. So when I realized that the Sumerians, who are in many ways are the inventors of slavery, because after all, the first records of slavery come from the ancient Sumerian culture in a place called Babylon. Now, remember, remember the Tower of Babel from history uh, lessons from the biblical story? Ancient Babel was a place where they all spoke one common language. They had a common theme, and they had figured how to become interconnected. Now, the word that they use in the ancient Aramaic is this word called Shem. Now, uh, a Hashem or a Shem is what we call a name, but that is not a good translation for this word to English, in my view. As we look into the idea of the, these people were building a tower, the ancient tower of Babylon, this is the actual historical ruins. Saddam Hussein's palace sat on that little spiraling uh, feature there. And that was the actual ruins of the Tower of Babel. So it's a historical archaeological site. And what, what it says in the scriptures, both biblical and extra biblical, is that they built this tower so that they could travel into the heavens to build a name for themselves. So the word, the word Shem or name in, in the Hebrew is linked to an idea of a codex. 
an idea of a source coding that creates a reaction in folks. So that's essentially what they're talking about when they say a name, a technology. So all of a sudden, when we think of technology, technology is linked in the ancient, ancient records to the idea of a big bang and the formation of life itself. At the Tower of Babel, they were very interconnected. And so the idea that the languages were confused, the codes were confused. Remember when Microsoft had their security platform hacked by the government? Well, how, how did it go? They, the government said, you've got too much of a monopoly. We want to pull out your code. So that's, they confused the languages. And it, it reminds me of this important term called emergence, and which is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of multiplicity uh, of relative simple networks. In other words, if you have a complex problem to solve and you have a colony of ants, a single ant cannot solve the complex problem. But through emergence, through emergence and through their interconnectivity, an a, a colony of ants can solve very intellectual complex problems because their collective interconnectivity, their collective intelligence. So as we move forward to discuss slavery and technology, I think that emergence is an important concept because, after all, we've been fighting slavery generation after generation, and it seems like every year, hundred years or so, we fool ourselves by thinking somehow we've done it. But what happens is we don't connect all the dots to actually finish the job. So today, there's more slaves than any time in human history. They say that there's upwards of 27 million slaves worldwide. And, and if you think about it, we're living in this technology where we're all connected, and yet at the same time, the technology is being used to lure, coerce, and subjugate women and girls into slavery. There's a shot of the Tower of Babel, which was, which was uh, an actual thing that happened. And what was what's cited as what was the problem by the ancients was the fact that they had developed emergence. They had developed interconnectivity amongst themselves so that no problem that they, that they sought to solve was unsolvable. They could literally tap into eternity. Their system was propagated in Egypt. The, in the legends of slavery, we see that the, the god of Egypt, which was Ra, the sun god, left Egypt, became known as Amun-Ra, went to this historical character in, in Babylon uh, named Nimrod, and that's where the Tower of Babel was formed, from the, from the Amun-Ra. Of course, the story picks up later in, in the various histories, but the, all, the, all the archaeological ruins are there. They would form shrines, and from these shrines, they would then recruit young women and girls to work as shrine prostitutes. The men would oftentimes be subjugated into labor and be forced to build pyramids. So we have the vestiges of these communities and the archaeological ruins of what slavery produced in the past, and they're still with us today. Unfortunately, I don't think that we've answered the questions as to why, as, as a single human community, why as a human, single human community would we subjugate each other to slavery in order to pursue these material uh, objectives? And of course, the hanging gardens of Babylon are, are there as a reminder to us. As the science progressed, some very, very interesting people came on the scene. Of course, the founder of modern science, Sir Isaac Newton, he became famous, of course, for the apple falling out of his head, but uh, determining gravity, of course. But what he did is remarkable. He was able, he was a student of the ancient literatures, so he would study mystical traditions in literature. And what he did was he took the ratio of the Ark of the Covenant, which was 1.5 cubits by 2.5 cubits, and he, he created a numerical factor, which he called the sacred proportion. And he multiplied that times pi times 360. Then his, after him, Sir, uh, Sir, uh, another, another scientist helped him to, de to develop, essentially, the diameter of the Earth. So the father of modern day science, Sir Isaac Newton, with the help of Sir John Watson, they were able to determine the diameter of the Earth. And from that, there was a curvature of the Earth that was able to be determined, and then they changed something. They changed the measurement of distance. Using technology, 
they said the kilometer, which was distance over a straight line, was not as accurate of a way of measuring navigation on the oceans, but rather distance over the curvature of the Earth was a better way of going. So today, if I travel to Japan, or if I go to China, or if I go to the Philippines, or to Indonesia, wherever I go, there, there's English is almost a second language. And it's remarkable when we think about that, why that is the case. Is it, is it because of our literature? Is it because is it because of our culture? Is it because of our democracy? Well, it may have something to do with the nautical mile, an actual technological advantage. But of course, that technology was used, those ships were used to go and bring the African slaves out of Africa and bring them across into the New Worlds to become enslaved. And so what, we, what we've seen from the ancient history, both from Babylon to Egypt to today, is the use of technology to empower a certain group of people, but at the same time to subjugate and put others into a position of vulnerability to that technology. Of course, after the, the, the initial founders of modern science had their run, a gentleman came on the scene named Cantor. And what Cantor did is he, he's, he's, he reinvented for all practical purposes, mathematics. Now, we already had this mathematics in some of our ancient languages related to Chinese and Aramaic. But what Cantor did is he said, let's take a seed and let's plant a seed. And we'll say the seed is a line. And then the law of how that seed divides is we take the line and we divide the line in half. So in the first generation, we plant the seed. In the second generation, we divide the line in half and execute the law of growth. Then those, those two become four, those four become eight. The byte system was developing. The idea of utilizing zeros and ones in low level language to create an operating system through which interconnectivity and intelligence could be communicated. So of course, what happened to Cantor? He, he went crazy and, and ended up in an insane asylum. But he inspired a group of mathematicians, Fournier and some others, who developed what they called immortal math or chaos theory. The idea that 1 plus 1 equals 2 was a concept in what we call mortal math. But 1 plus 1 equals infinity is reflected in this, because a seed is planted and it divides to infinity. So it's a different, it's a different construct of looking at mathematics and physics that Cantor and Fournier developed for us. And of course, that, that, those were the seeds that led, of course, to the computer coming on the scene. So here we are. We're in the year 2013. We have more slaves than we've ever had at any time in human history. It's the fastest growing illegal business. And the technology is on the rise to both enslave the human and to free the human. And so I'm here today largely to ask for your help because, gosh, these pimps and these traffickers are utilizing the internet and Facebook and net social networking sites to find their victims. And from there, what they do is they recruit them using a whole series of mechanisms and they then subject them into slavery. And the police and the law enforcement task forces that we work with at Abolish Slavery, they're not as tech savvy, per se, as some of the traffickers and pimps who are out there preying on young women and girls. So what are we going to do? How are we going to catch up with the bad guys in this particular issue? For me, I had this experience where Early on in the, in, in the human trafficking movement, I became a vice detective looking for victims. So I was the guy who was the undercover person. I would pose as a John. I would go into brothels, and I would essentially try to interview a victim to find out if they were a victim of, of sex trafficking. Generally speaking, I would look for the youngest ones that I could find. And I would wear a wire, because I needed a technology to actually document the crime. But the problem was is that the wire was so, it was so, I had a transponder and the wire went from my shirt, not unlike the microphone I'm wearing now, it went from my shirt to here and then I had to have a backpack to pick up the signal. And I used to get such anxiety over the wire. I would come into my hotel room and it'd be sitting there on the counter and my heart would start racing. Oh my gosh, the wire. I would, I would get very, very nervous that somehow 
I would get caught wearing the wire and something bad would happen. And so I began to project from that, from the, the, from that thinking, I began to project fear onto the device. And what I had done was I had put a reminder of fear in front of myself and it began to inhibit my ability to work with the victim in the room. And what I do when I enter that room is I'm trying to get to know the person and win their trust. But if I'm afraid, if I'm filled with doubt, how am I going to do that? It's very difficult to win someone's trust if you're doubtful and you're fearing. And I meditated on it. I thought to myself, you know, I've got to put the wire away. I cannot work with the wire and have it out and see it and have my heart start beating as a reaction, almost like a Pavlov's dog reaction. I ring the bell and the dog would think dinner's coming. Well, I would see the wire and I would become fearful. And, and what I realized is that I needed to keep the vision of what I was trying to do in front of me, not the fear. So I had put a vision of something that created fear and doubt in front of me, and it was affecting the way that I performed in my job. So what I did instead is I looked for an alternative to the wire. And uh, it's interesting, you know, you, you laugh about it, but it, it, it sh these birds says it's a, it's a bit freaky with the wireless technology. They're just hanging on nothing there in the air. And that's what I was looking for. I was looking to become the person that could work in that room with the victims in a way where I wouldn't be caught wearing a wire and get beat up or worse. So as time went on, I realized I needed to put something in front of me. I needed to keep my vision in front of me. And what I, I began to do is I looked at the wire and instead of having the wire there, I replaced it with a key. And I put a key there on the, on the counter in front of me. And that made a huge difference for me because when I would walk by and see my keys there, all of a sudden I would realize, oh yeah, I put the keys there because the wire was there before. And the key is this thing that will unlock these victims from being enslaved. Even myself, I can unlock my own, my own issues, my own problems, because I was doubting myself. I thought, why, why should I be the guy to be doing this? Um, how did I end up here? Uh, how can I possibly sustain this? It's so expensive. All of these doubts and things arised in my mind that probably could have changed my path so that I wouldn't have continued. But I began to realize that not only was the technology this great macro big bang phenomenon, but the technology was also this micro thing inside of me. It was a micro macro situation where both my life and the technology and the application of them to freedom for others was something very relevant to what was going on in my life. I discovered Dr. Masaru Emoto. Now, he's a very controversial figure in the scientific community because he developed a theory which sort of lends itself to what I'm talking about right now. His idea was to take water, dirty water, from a dam, bring in a group of, of folks who could meditate over the water, and then measure the molecules and take pictures of the water crystals prior to the meditation and then following the meditation. And he discovered some shocking things. And if you look on the figure, it, it shows the water from the dam. Um, and then it shows the, the water from the dam after the offering of a prayer. And he, he essentially photographed water by putting love on water, thank you. And he began to notice that whatever the messaging was, whatever the consciousness of the people who were meditating over that water had, it affected the molecular structure of the water. So he reduplicated the experiment over and over again. He was criticized by the scientific community for going straight to the public and not, not debating this further in the scientific community. But whether or not you buy into his, his, his theories or not, the idea that our conscious, our conscious thoughts affect us not only on a molecular level within ourselves, but the people around us. And what I began to realize was that I was talking myself out of successfully rescuing girls out of this life. And what I was talking myself into by projecting fear, by projecting doubt, I was, I was literally manifesting that. I was, I was manifesting getting caught wearing a wire. And it's a very dramatic scene. They, they rip the wire from you and then, then they smash it and then the next thing you know there's three guys at the door and your hair and this and that and do I fight back or whatever. So 
all of that was something that I was able to actually manifest through my fear of it. And I had to change my thinking. So when I found the water molecule study, I realized that if I, if I create positive affirmations for myself, if I have a can-do attitude instead of a, oh my gosh, what will happen if that happens attitude, I needed people to speak favor over me. I was out there maybe a little bit too much on my own, and I began to doubt and fear. Another analogy that helped me was that the idea that I had reached a point where I was crawling in this movement. I couldn't raise the funding. If I rescued a victim, I could barely take care of that one particular person. I needed wings to fly. I needed to find out a way to move from my caterpillar position into a position of becoming a butterfly. And I did that by going to graduate school and studying the subject of the Jubilee. Now Jubilee was this ancient musician who lived way back in ancient Samaria, nearly 5,000 years ago. He's called the father of all musicians. But today, we still call a good party after his name. We still use his name, Jubilee. If the queen has a 50-year anniversary, it's the Jubilee. So I went to graduate school. I studied the ancient law of the Jubilee, which was found not only in biblical tradition, but in all the peripheral traditions, because the musician, Jubilee himself, was so ancient that he, we find Jubilee in Tibetan Buddhism, we find Jubilee in Christianity, in Islam, it's, it's, it's in Judaism, it, it's in, in Hinduism, it's found cross-platform uh, amongst all societies. So I, I essentially wrote a thesis, I wrote a book, I had a dream. And instead of, instead of approaching my dream with fear, I began to put my vision in front of me. I, I had these little these little circles that had chains broken and I'd put it up over my bed and I'd wake up in the morning and I would see there the broken chains and I would think to myself, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I would, I would speak favor over myself. I found some, uh, at the time I was working with a, a rock band um, and I found some incredible musicians who, were, who would help me. And we traveled to the G8 summits. We asked all the other musicians we could find to sign petitions, and we set the world record for the biggest petition ever created. It was millions and millions of signatures. And we submitted it at the G8 summit in 1999 to Bill Clinton and the political leaders to drop third world debt. And it was a huge success. So I had taken a few of the little principles that I had, which was positive, affirmations, but not just positive affirmations. Changing my mindset. It's one thing to have a positive mentality. It's another thing to say, I'm going to be transformed by renewing my mind. So I began to try to think of ways that I could renew my thinking. The, the campaign was a huge success. Bono took the lead. Uh, Perry Farrell and Bob Geldof were, were, were big supporters. We, we raised a lot of money. We parlayed that now the Jubilee was forgiving debts and freeing slaves, and I wanted to try to manifest this in my life. So I sought out to first forgive debts, and we forgave third world debt. Still working today with Rolling Jubilee, that is an organization that works to relieve uh, medical debt for people who have fallen into poverty. But uh, the Jubilee was a two-pronged thing, forgiving debts and also freeing slaves. In 1997, uh, when I was working with Michael P. Hale, I didn't know where slavery existed. I just knew that it, theoretically it was something I wanted to talk about, uh, the idea of being enslaved to myself, my own thinking, or, the, or the, my ability to transform from that caterpillar position to a butterfly and renew my mind. So what did we do? We went online, we used technology to find out where there were slaves. So I, I, I essentially went into a search engine and I typed in slavery, and I saw where, I began looking at a few links, and I saw that there was slavery in Sudan. So after a, we, we created a concert tour, we did some festivals, we raised some money, and the next thing you know, I was on a plane on my way to this country, Sudan, flying over the Nile River, crossing the, the border of Kenya into Sudan. There's a city called Lokichokyo, and it's sort of your last outpost before you, you're going all the way inside, where there's really no more hospitals, there's no more infrastructure, no more Coca-Cola, no more bottled water. It's ceramic water filters after this point. We land, the local military greets us, 
And you know, at the time, I, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. I just knew that I, I wanted to be involved in freeing slaves. And so we land, and the reality hadn't really hit me yet. I was sort of living this sort of, it was kind of like the Lion King. The trees were similar, there was drum music playing, and, and I, I romanticized Africa so much that when I landed, it, it hadn't really hit me what was about to happen. So we're landing, the plane is there, and they begin loading bodies into body bags to move them on trucks out of the region because the Civil War between the North and South was very bloody. And the Janjaweed, these, these raiders, were being supported by this group nobody had ever heard of called Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda was there, and they were then looking to subjugate people into slavery to, to promote the, the well-being of some of their sponsors. So we would unload the survival kits and deal with the Murahaleen, a group of, we call them the Schindlers of the Taliban. There were these humanitarian Muslim guys who had helped to devise an underground railroad in Sudan, bringing the victims out from the north, from this place no one had ever heard of, Darfur. The slaves come out, there's some, you start to put a face on slavery and to realize that a slave is not the same as a free person. A free person is responsible for all their decisions. Somebody who's a victim of slavery, they have very little responsibility in their life. And so when you begin to see this humble spirit, my first encounters with slaves was really shocking because they would just look down and they, they wouldn't give eye contact and they would just answer yes or no. They were very, very submissive. Some of the children that we encountered in the camps had nothing at all. They, they had come back to the Underground Railroad and along the way someone saw shorts or shirt and would take it from them. But ultimately, reuniting them with their families after that arduous journey was an incredible moment in my life. I realized something about myself, that whatever dreams and, and goals that I had had before of having this big music festival or doing these things, those, those dreams were fine, but the idea of liberating people had, had superseded all my other plans. And it became sort of my master dream for my life, the, the ability to take what I've been given the education that I'm learning and to try to use it in, instead of per se pursuing material things on my own, but to help liberate others. I was a Forrest Gump. I was in the right place at the right time when some things were happening. I had hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews of slaves. And so we took our package to the US government and they passed a law called the Trafficking Victim Protection Act of 2000. This was a big milestone because like the Emancipation Proclamation, the Trafficking Victim Protection Act empowered law enforcement by providing nearly $500,000 of funding for every single jurisdiction. A lot of the contracts went to me. Um, and as I, as I approached the work, I first went to uh, Nicaragua. I had, I had always been doing slavery sort of intellectually. I was looking at the different organizations. I was seeing how they worked in task forces. This one's good at shelters. This one's good at investigations. This one's, this one's good at uh, uh, psychological help. I, and I, I was completely analyzing everything all the time. But when I began to get the contracts to do the investigation in sex trafficking assessments, that's when I had to really, really work on my mindset because fear could easily creep back in. How many of us say, uh, I can't do that job? I can't, I can't get that promotion. Uh, I, can't, I can't be in this relationship. I can't do this, I can't do that. I had to change my mindset in order to be able to do the, the investigations. So largely, that meant changing my environment because in order for me to keep a positive mindset, I had to have a team around me, and I have a great team. And by, by changing my environment and getting into an environment that was going to speak favor over my life, I was able to change my mindset properly and then begin the process of essentially becoming a, a vice agent in sex trafficking investigations. I was in Miami. And I met somebody who would become a little bit of a mentor for me and inspire me. And I, I don't know if you recognize her picture, but her name is Sadella Booker. 
and she's a very famous mother. She's the mother of Bob Marley. And so I was friends with her godson, and we went to visit her one day, and she pulled out her Bible and began studying and was very interested in slavery, knew that I was working in Sudan trying to free slaves. And we began a little study, and I showed her, I showed her the Tower of Babel, and I showed her the, the movement to free slaves in the ancient world under the prophet Elijah. And, I, and we, talked about, um, we talked about the different the different historical characters who had played a huge role. And, and she brought up Haile Selassie, who, whose famous line, uh, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And all of a sudden, the idea that it's much different than a positive mindset to free your mind. To free your mind is a different thing than being positive. It, it, means, it means transforming the way you're thinking and no longer conforming any, any longer to the pattern of the world. Because the pattern of the world puts us into our cubicle, it puts us into our position, and it tells us, you do this job and that's your identity. So to get beyond that, Mama B basically said to me, you should write your memoir. You know. If you think about what happened with Bob Marley, she had a situation with Bob Marley where here's this young man, he's living in a place where there's a lot of poverty, there's not a lot of opportunity to travel or, or do much there, but what she did was speak favor over his life. You can do it. You can change the world from right here. It begins with yourself. And she, she was so proud to talk about how her and her son spent a lot of time growing up and how he was very inspired by the, by the whole idea of freedom and that freedom for himself, for his people, for his, for his country, for the world was a huge ideal for him. So after a, an hour of an inspiring session with Mama B, I I left and a little while later the phone rang. She had invited me back that weekend for another study. I said, sure, yeah, I'll study with Bob Marley's mom. <laughs> And so I went back to the house, and uh, she had this book, and the book had been translated to Hebrew. And it was her memoir. It was her life story. And she wanted to give me the book. And she basically said to me, you need to write your story. You need to write your story. She spoke favor over my life. And that inspiration for me helped me realize that if I'm going to change my little ripple into a big bang, I'm going to need to use technology to get my story out, and I'm going to need to use technology to take on organized crime, and I'm going to need to use technology on myself biologically to change my mind, to change my thinking, because I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't know how, if any of you have ever looked down the barrel of a gun, but it, is a, it changes the way that you think because you realize how much of, your, of life we're taking for granted. And so I did it. I wrote, I wrote the book. From that point on, I began to really work on myself in the context of the investigation. So I, I, I went at it with a vengeance. I was traveling 80% of the time on one contract or the other for one organization or another. Working in Cambodia, I would work in the karaoke brothels, singing karaoke to young, basically children in the brothels. We would find a victim in there. Uh, we would ask her to go get all of her young friends. They would all be rescued by the police. Uh, maybe a year or two later, I would go back and be reunited with them. Very proud moment the day that Chani graduated from high school. We had rescued her when she was 13 years old. So when she was 17 and graduating from high school, they invited me to come present her her diploma. So I went and I presented Jaunty and the other girls their diplomas. And it was a, it be, I began to realize that, you know what, I'm just one person. And as one person, I can have an impact on, on the people around me, the people that I love, my family and friends. You know, Gracie's here, and Melissa's here, and, and uh, Sandy, and Michael. These are people that I've known for, for, for a long time, who I love, that speak favor over my life. If I didn't have that, if I didn't have the right environment, I don't know if I could have reached the point emotionally and psychologically. Even today, as I'm preparing for the missions that are coming up, I'm gonna be in that room again, wearing, wearing the microphone, uh, the rooms are fully cameraed, but I, I, have to, I have to essentially work on myself first. And by renewing my mind, 
I then prepare my, my, myself, my vessel, for to become a conduit, to be able to take a power greater than me and put it through me into the work. And that, that's, that may sound funny, but a lot of people, they sit at their cubicle or they sit at their desk and they think this is just my job and what I have to do. But I think that if you can get beyond that kind of thinking and start thinking that this is just a conduit, this is a vessel for me to channel a lot more through my life, it, it's, very, it's very transformative. Traveled to Iraq, worked on the slavery problem on the border between Syria and Iraq, very difficult situation there today. Traveled to Burma, uh, we, we doing human trafficking work, we run into a, an entire village of people who are starving to death because they're cut off in the war. I call Sandy, Sandy can you help out? We have a situation, the whole village is starving. So what does Sandy do? She, she buys truck loads, loads of rice and olive oil and, and milk powder and we organize a convoy, we risk it all and we get the village fed. Just problem solving along the way in Haiti after the earthquake. You saw from the video, the young boys were carrying cement after the earthquake and going around with the SWAT team. You know, when the, the prison collapsed and all the pirates in the Caribbean who were in jail got out in a single day. And they went to this one place, Cite de Soleil, the city of the sun, and they bu began buying arms from UN traders. And next thing you know, every day we go in, there's, this, there's these exchanges going on, but here's these little kids carrying cement blocks. And uh, it, it's remarkable when you think about it, uh, what both sides are struggling to do is get better technology. The, the prisoners who had escaped are looking for the best technology and weapons. The guards that are, the, the SWAT guys that we're working with are asking us, can you get us night vision? Can you get us this? Everybody's trying to scramble to get the technology. Um, but in a way, we're, we're, I see it as the dark ages because we're scrambling to get the technology to go against each other. When are we gonna be scrambling to get the technology to create the unity and the holistic life that as a human family we could, we could actually appreciate? We arrested a bunch of suspects, uh, took them to jail, and then we had the privilege of reuniting these children with their families. And I don't, I don't know if you know, but the gasp for breath when they hug each other Recently, we, we had this reunion in New York, young gal from our operation, I, I think that uh, Sandy mentioned to her, we call her Veronica. But Veronica was in a very dire situation, and when she was brought to her mother, when they embraced that gasp for air, oh, you'll see it, we filmed the whole thing. Same thing with young Arison. I'm still involved in Arison's life. Uh, we, last year, we got him a a, a bike and a cell phone, of all things. He's playing soccer, has a hurt leg from carrying bricks, um, his foot's hurt somehow, but he's moving on in his life. We always think of slavery over there, from the ancient world. We think of slavery, we think in Cambodia, Haiti, but did you know that the greatest demand for slavery in the world is in the United States? It's the demand for slavery that fuels the slave market. Who needs the slaves the most in terms of their economy? It's us. We have an entire generation of men who are learning sexuality on the internet, which is much different than how it was 15, 20 years ago. So nowadays, when an eight-year-old boy follows a link in his email to something he shouldn't be watching, it changes his sexuality, it changes him. It's not the favor that's being spoken over him that we were talking about earlier. So what we've done is we've began to try to use technology the way that the traffickers are. So I've, I've spent the whole winter in New York, and this is, a, this is a picture of our control room. You can see me there in, in the room waiting for the girl to arrive. I went on Backpage, and I worked with Detective Boffman, and the detective is just, he's just an ace at saying, this language of this ad, it looks like it's written by a pimp. And I think we should put her on the list. So the next thing you know, we've got a list of 30, 40 girls that we're gonna call, and then I call them, and we arrange a date. Uh, the girl comes to the hotel room. I'm in one room. I've got the 
police and security guys in the other room, and the room is wired, I mean wired, and very hot because there's all these big police guys in there, and the stakes are really high. It's illegal to solicit sex in our country, so if I say the wrong thing to a question, if I make a wrong response, I could be arrested, it, or what we're doing could be shut down by the police. So I'm walking this tightrope of explaining to the girl that, you know, I create a mess on the bed, I create a flow so that she goes straight to the room service table. I have staged a salad that's been barely eaten and I'm hungry and I'm ordering room service so that we, we flow from the date, from the encounter into the room service table. And then I begin to ask them questions about their life and I begin to share my challenges and my experiences with their life. And I'm, and I'm thinking in my mind, you know, if I can create emergence with this person, with others, if I can connect her to Melissa, if I can connect her to Sandy, I began to visualize in my mind to keep my vision in front of me with the victim there. And largely in the first encounter, I listen and try to develop trust. I'll cut up the date right at the hour, and I won't tip her. If it's 200 an hour or 300 an hour or 400 an hour, I just give her exactly that. But I'm taking notes the whole time. Is she on her cell phone? Is she texting? Is, what is she doing? You know the, what the pimps do? When the girl walks in the room, she's required in the first three minutes to text that I'm okay, to say what's going on. Then every three to five minutes, they're checking in. And you know why? Because 80% of prostituted women have violence uh, done on them by Johns. So the women are, are scared. A lot of them are shaking and nervous in the room. I try to make them feel at ease warm into the situation, get to know them, talk to them about my challenges, have them talk to me about their challenges. I may even project a false avatar on the young lady. I may say, oh, you're doing this because you love sex and you, you're probably going to meet some Prince Charming doing this work. No, not at all. I mean, other people chose this bag for me. Other people did this. And I, by projecting a false avatar, there's interrogative techniques that we can use. It's if you speak favor on somebody and it's what they want to hear, They'll say yes. If you, if you take something else, a false identity, and you project it on them, they will then correct it. When she begins to correct it, that's the beginning of the interview. From there, we can determine if she's a victim or not. And if she's a victim, then we collect the evidence with the cameras we have. And we're using largely HD cameras. But I, I'm no longer wearing the wire. I, finally, my cell phone has reached the point where I have high definition on my cell. I have uh, my, my partner, Detective Boffman, in the next room, and he's texting me just like the girl's being texted. He's my lifeline. She may go to the bathroom and he'll say, she's in the bathroom, don't turn your back. So I'll have to turn around and make sure that I never have my back to the victim because I could be stabbed. Something bad could happen, God forbid. So I'm keeping my key the, on the counter in front of me. I'm keeping the mindset in front of me. I'm thinking to myself positive thoughts. I'm projecting the renewing of my mind on this person. We're talking about deep philosophical things, about freedom, about slavery, about the use of her phone. The technology has become this intimate companion in the human trafficking investigation. And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that the pimps and the traffickers are ahead of the rescuers. They're ahead of us technologically. They've found the way to use anonymity and denial. The technology has afforded them through the use of the internet to create anonymity and denial amongst the Johns. And there's more Johns in the United States than there is any country in the world because we have a, a, the biggest middle class economy and there's more men willing to buy sex in our country. The problem is there are not enough women willing to satisfy the demand. So what happens when that, when that happens? What happens is the market says, okay, let's make it more expensive. And so what happens is that human trafficking networks need to lure, coerce, corral, and subjugate young girls into trafficking. And they do it on Facebook, they do it on Instagram, they, they, they do it on all the popular platforms. You know, the thing is, is that I was excited to speak at Google because of all the companies that I've seen there's a lot of companies out there that have issues with slavery. All of us, as Americans, we have issues with slavery because of a lot of our products, whether they're t-shirts or tomatoes or 
chocolate or whatever it is. There's slavery is, is reaching its little fingers everywhere, everywhere in our lives right now. But the thing about Google is, is that they're investing in the intelligentsia. A couple of my friends have PhDs in human trafficking or working with Google to look for solutions in technology. Um, there's some guys at USC who are working on technology and human trafficking to, to, to find ways for us to utilize the technology to identify the victims and to rescue them. So if you look at the setup in New York, it's, it, it's, we've got some sophisticated stuff, but so do the traffickers, so do the pimps. This is a shot of uh, Detective Boffman, my partner. He's uh, watching me in the other room, and, and one of the cameras is on him, and he's taking notes on every single detail that occurs. So, you know, when I look out here, I'm not looking, I'm not looking at regular people. You are not regular folks. You know, I'm, I'm looking at royalty here. You are royalty. You live in an economy you have an intellect, you work at one of the top companies in the world, I'm looking at geniuses here. Geniuses who can change the world. It just takes getting up off the chair, renewing your mindset. But I really believe that if you get out of the habit, like I was, of saying, I can't rescue that victim, I can't get legislation to happen, I can't get out of this contract with this nonprofit organization, I can't and you start saying to yourself, I can invent that new technology. I can go upwards in my company. I can reinvent myself. I can do better in that relationship. I think it's our ability to speak favor over, over each other and our ability to renew our mind, that's where the freedom is at. You know, the more I get involved in, in slavery and the issues of slavery, the more I realize how enslaved I am to my own addictions, to, my, to my, own, my own old ways of thinking. So I want to, in closing, I want to inspire you to think about not just positivity, not just thinking positively, but actually renewing your mind, catching yourself in moments of doubt. I'm just one person. I, I'm a guy who thought he could somehow learn about slavery from there, I became someone who thought, hey, you know, maybe I could actually get involved in the field work. Uh, so I went from studying it intellectually to then getting involved in the field work. And then from there, I realized, gosh, I'm just a small, I'm this small fish in a big pond, and I'm in Sudan. And how am I going to change my little ripple into something bigger, into a big bang? And the answer is technology. Technology with myself on the micro level, the way I affect the molecular structure of the water in my body through speaking favor over my life, but also changing the world outside of me with the speaking favor over others, with, a, with the mentality of renewing the mind, with the use of technology to create emergence. Emergence. Because by yourself, by myself, I can't do this work. I need Sandy. I need Melissa. I need Michael. It's our emergence that's going to create an end to slavery. We will continue to free captives through our interconnectedness. And so I want to thank you for, for listening today. And I, and I want to encourage you to think about how you can utilize technology to create a greater sense of emergence in your life. Thank you very much. Can you discuss the extent of <clears throat> the problem for boys? It's a good question. It, it's interesting how our society uh, almost condones the exploitation of women and girls. Because when you see a very young girl at a club, people don't think twice about it. But when you go looking for young boys, they're so hidden away that you've really got to be seeking and finding to get it. You, you've, you've got to actually know that's what you're going after. I've worked on some investigations uh, regarding young boys. And generally speaking, they will, they will take a young boy and they will put him into a, a strip club or a brothel situation. And then he's there cleaning or whatnot. 
and then customers will come in and someone will see and say, you know, so it, it's similar with boys and girls, the way they utilize them, but they represent a much smaller demographic than women. Um, of all the 27 million slaves worldwide, upwards of 80% are females and young females. So it, it is a problem with boys. Um, it's a much more recondite problem. It's hidden from everybody and it's very difficult to find it. It's difficult to find it from a, an investigative perspective. You can find it online, no mistake about it. The will amongst society to do something about it is not the same thing as with women. We're both accepting of the slavery of women in our society and we're, we, almost, we almost put the, the boy issue uh, away. Now from a law enforcement perspective, there's people doing something about it. I'm glad that they are. You know, I've worked on some assignments myself. It's, much, it's more difficult and more me needs to be done. However, I think it's good that we talk about human trafficking and slavery in the context of women predominantly because after all, they make up the vast, vast majority of victims who are being exploited. I was wondering um, how closely you work with some of these technology companies whose products are being used to sort of perpetuate this worldwide and do you help them monitor or watch out for this on their systems or train people within these companies to, to watch out for it and escalate it appropriately? Well, the question regarding whether or not we work with the companies that have the issue is it's always a sort of a you can have an adversarial relationship or a cooperative relationship. And in the case of Craigslist, we had an adversarial relationship because, you know, you go to these people, you say, little boys and little girls are being sold on your web page and they're being, uh, lives are being lost. Here's a whole list of the victims. Here's a list of the ones that died. Here's a list of the ones who are recovering. They were sold on your service and there's no return call. There's no, there's no, nothing. And then there's some brazen remark about how we can't police the internet. We're against, uh, we're in favor of net neutrality. So what happens is, is when people are making a lot of money on something, um, we had a similar problem with Backpage because Backpage, uh, Village Voice Media, um, Backpage owned, owned Village Voice Media. So we, we organized some protests and we went down there and and protested at Village Voice headquarters in New York and, and um, made a passionate plea. And what happened was, is the company sold off its, its Village Voice. It's almost like a, a mob operation where the mob would have a restaurant and they own the restaurant. There's never any customers there, but they have meetings there. And then what happens is you find out, okay, this is your restaurant. Then what they do is they sell the restaurant and move somewhere else. So in a sense, that's what happened in the back page uh, analogy. In terms of tech companies that we're working with, um, there's some great products that, that, that Google has coming out that I'm excited about. Um, a lot of the cloud services and the, the, the ability to network with people and, and have video conferencing are huge components for us. If we could have greater access to video, video chat, that would be a huge thing. The other thing is cameras. Um, we're looking, we, we need to find a tech company that can make a smaller, more in, a smaller type of audio recording device that doesn't, that, that we have memory so small, it, wouldn't it make sense to make a microphone really small that could, that could get, grab all the audio properly? Because the audio becomes key with law enforcement and getting the warrant to rescue the victim. So, but we, we have cell phone technologies which have, which have advanced tremendously and you know, in, in New York, the New York Police Department, they subpoenaed my video and my audio recordings from one of our investigations. The pimp was beating her up and was caught on camera. The use of technology from the street corner gets her getting beat up, he goes into jail, and then uh, he gets out of jail, and I'm on my way to her to try to get to her at the shelter, but he gets to her first. It, if we had uh, the right kind of technology communication set up between the shelters, we would have been able to intercede on that victim's behalf. So most of the, most of the, the relationship with tech companies has been 
to show the, the problem online, whether it was Craigslist or Backpage, but in terms of companies that are making products that are functional in the investigation, of course, Apple and Google, and I would like to see them take a bigger role, not just in discussing this subject intellectually or funding more studies, but actually developing technologies that will enable us to camera a room and get audio and video in a way where it doesn't require an entire army of wires and components in the next room. We're still in the dark ages a little bit on the technology, and I know that the technology exists, so I don't have a sponsorship with a tech company. Um, I've worked uh, against a number of the platforms that the victims are being sold on, and I've seen other companies step forward and start doing things, and are, for example, Hershey, there's an issue with chocolate slavery, but they're starting to look at ways to utilize technology in, in the Ivory Coast and in Ghana to mo better monitor what's going on in the thousands of farms and whatnot to sort, sort of try to intervene. So I think that the traffickers are ahead of the tech companies because they get the products first and begin utilizing them before the tech companies have them in the hands of the, the human rights activists. All right. Thank you.